From last time, we've now got a great idea of what a realistic endpoint for zero emissions looks like. It means closing things that cause emissions anyway, electrifying all of our uses of energy, halving the amount of electricity we require, and then filling in the gaps by new forms of business, creating new entrepreneurial opportunities. But what we've done so far is to talk about the end point, where we're trying to get to by 2050. What we want to do in this last film is to think about the journey. What do we do now on our journey to getting there? And the most important thing about that is to get started. There is a danger that we wait to form the perfect plan, and as we do so, the amount of time left to act keeps getting shorter. It's much more important to start than to wait. And having a target to get to zero emissions by a certain date is very challenging. If you remember back to the first film, then the emissions accumulated in the atmosphere like a tank are what we care about. So instead of having a linear journey to zero, another way of thinking of the transition is to make a certain percentage cut each year. And it turns out that getting to zero from now by 2050 is about equivalent to cutting our emissions by 6% year on year on year. That's much more achievable. It means this year we work out how we cut by 6% and while we're doing that, we're thinking about what we could start to do next year. All of us can be involved in that, whether at work, at home or in the community groups in which we function. Let's try and break that down into three different forms of those groups. So as householders, uh, it's quite confusing. We get so much information about green behaviour. But as my friend and colleague David Mackay said so uh, sharply, if everybody does a little, we get a little. It really doesn't matter if people recycle their newspapers on the way to flying to Spain for the weekend. It matters that they do the things that are big. And here they are. There are four things that we influence at home that have a big difference. The amount of ruminant meat we eat, the type of car we use, the amount of journeys we take in aeroplanes, and the way we use our gas boiler. Here's the data, and this is, I think, quite helpful, broken down into units that we're all familiar with. On average, each of us in the UK flies for 10 hours per year. If you're flying for more than that, that means that that's probably the dominant component of your emissions. You can see that that causes about 1,700 kilograms of CO2 per person per year on average. So cutting the number of hours we spend in aeroplanes is one of the easiest things that all of us can change. The average car in the UK, you can see, uses around about 600 litres of fuel. And so either we can use it less, or we can have more people in it, or of course in due time we're going to switch to having an electric car anyway. On average, we consume 14 kilograms of beef and 5 kilograms of meat from sheep. We often call that lamb. Uh, per person per year. That has a very high emissions profile and it's a relatively easy one to reduce that by 6% per year or even faster if some of the other activities are harder to cut. Our gas boiler is a major driver of emissions. It's difficult to adjust that year by year but gas boilers last for about 10 to 15 years. So between now and 2050 there are probably two moments when you'll get the chance to change and to switch from that to using an electric heat pump. And as we said last time, we think that that will probably be uh, the next form of major regulation passed in the UK. If you add up those four activities, it accounts for nearly half of all of the emissions created in the UK. And these are things that we influence by our own direct personal choices. As an employee or as a member of a community group, we have influence over a wider range of uh, drivers of emissions. We can't influence everything, we can't change the way that agriculture is operated, for example, but we can influence the amount of material used for building projects or the total demand for trucks and freight transport and so on. So the sorts of things that we could be doing at work are to ask questions like, do I have to do this international travel in person or could I attend virtually? Do we as an organisation really need a new building or could we adapt the buildings that we already have or buy an old building and adapt that to our purposes to avoid all this new use of emissions intensive materials? Could we in the canteen agree that we're going to reduce our consumption of beef and lamb, perhaps only have it for special occasions and then slowly reduce that uh, over time as well? Why don't we display our gas consumption uh, in, the, in the lifts and agree that we're going to cut that by 6% per year by better management of the radiators and the way that we use heating uh, over the winter. 
There are lots of things that once we understand the drivers of the main causes of emissions, we can act on collectively simply by raising awareness of them in the workplace. As citizens, of course, we can have a wider vote, obviously by the way that we vote, but we can also be more active. We can write to our MPs to ask them for further, firmer commitments on driving the regulation that will cause change across all of these areas. We can use our contacts in the media, whether we're writing to newspapers or responding to journalists in different forms, in order to flag inconsistencies between political targets and current political messaging or choices. We want to get to zero emissions and we want everybody to be working together to get there. As customers, we can write to the companies that sell us goods. We can ask them to supply different forms of good. If we're dissatisfied with our fridges lasting too short a time, we can explain that we would pay extra for a long-lasting fridge, perhaps a smaller one. Perhaps we'd like a different way of owning a car, so we can normally have a small car, but occasionally use a large one for longer trips with the family. We can spend our money in different ways and we can invest our money in different ways. The way that we design our pension can be a way that indicates to investors as a whole that they should shift their funding towards activities that are compatible with zero emissions. For anybody under the age of 37 or so at the moment, then their pension is going to mature after 2050, after the date that we're operating in zero emissions. So you want to be sure that the firms that your pension is invested in can still legally trade at that point. At the moment, the aviation industry, for example, will not be able to trade because they have no zero emissions flights. So they're not a good long-term investment for your pension. We can also raise concerns. We're all part of networks of social groups where this topic isn't discussed much at the moment. We don't have to become evangelists, but when the opportunity arises, we can express our own concern, talk about the actions we've taken, and that's the most effective way of other people starting to take uh, actions in their own lifestyle. We all have more influence than we think. When we spend money, we have an influence. When we earn money, we have an influence. I'm always amazed by newspapers that write about the importance of zero emissions and then on the next page have an advert for a short uh, a weekend in California where you fly uh, with enormous emissions intensity. The way we invest... The way we influence, how we talk about what we do at work or at home as private or public people, uh, we can be sharing how important we th see this is. In groups, we can be talking about what matters, about real solutions to climate mitigation, not the imaginary ones of new energy technologies. In local government, we can share our voice in planning decisions. It should not be possible to build a new housing development where you need a car just to get to the shop to buy some milk. There are some simple collective decisions that we can influence. Through social protest, which might mean taking part in marches, or it might just mean making your voice heard as a counter to the high emitting habits that keep persisting. And of course, by the way that we vote. Behind these Tick Zero films is a website which gives the evidence that we've used to develop the films and through that we're inviting you to contribute your own suggestions. We're going to use it to share ideas of where there are networks whose advice we trust to help make progress in different areas. Even if it's only sharing the need for something which doesn't yet exist, one of the ones I'm very aware of, it's very hard to get advice on how to upgrade your home at the moment. We desperately need more advisory services. And of course, if you found these films helpful, please do share them, because this is trying to give a realistic message, one that has to be shared widely in order to become effective. At the end of these six films, we've agreed that getting to zero emissions is an absolutely urgent crisis. We have no choice about doing so. Shutting our eyes and hoping for a new energy technology solution to come and take the problem away from us is a one-way bet and by not activating alternative solutions, today's politicians are taking a huge and unreliable gamble. We have to start other things going um, as, at the same time. And what we've shown here is that we can do it with technologies that already exist today because we know that we can scale those solutions. There's plenty of hope. We can live very well in a real zero emissions future, but it won't be invisible. We're all involved in the change. Some aspects of our life will change, 
For a short period, there will be a need for restraint, but the things that we most value can grow and expand while we do that. There are lots of opportunities for entrepreneurship and growing new businesses, but we're all involved. We all have more power than we think as agents of change. And at the end of the film, what I hope more than anything is that we now share a more realistic vision for what the real journey to zero emissions actually means.